History credits American youth with remarkable accomplishments and great responsibilities. Even in adolescence, the young Americans of the founding era were scholars, diplomats, even military leaders. Have we failed to recognize the potential in our young people today? Is it time for Americans to raise their expectations for the next generation? Join historian David Barton with special guests Glenn Beck, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, and more as they explore the America our founding fathers envisioned. What if America's story is bolder, more colorful, and more compelling than you ever imagined? This is Foundations of Freedom. Welcome to Foundations of Freedom, where we'll look back at important aspects of our common heritage about which very few folks today have ever heard. Joining me today is Rick Green. Rick is an attorney, he's a former legislator, he's an author of numerous books, and he's also head of Patriot Academy, a great youth organization that trains our young people to be future civil leaders. Rick, you and I get to do almost a daily national radio program that we do, so it's good to have you here as well. Great to be with you. It's an honor to be with you on this program, and today we're going to talk about something very near and dear to my heart, as you mentioned, Patriot Academy, youth, our expectations yeah. of youth, uh, youth achievement, and, and the difference between the founding era and today. Our first question is really going to get us right into it. Here we go. I've seen so many college graduates move back in with their parents. It seems to me like it's getting harder and harder to tell when a young person actually becomes an adult and should start acting like one. Why is that? I just have a hard time imagining the founding fathers moving back in with mom and dad. Oh, you know, that's what George Washington did. Sure. Yeah, he yeah. Made, yeah. Didn't go off and fight wars, didn't go no. off and run a country. So there is a difference. I think this question is spot on. Today we do have a, a, a terrible trend of really just waiting till you're in your late 20s, 30s, 40s before you even find out what you want to do with your life. Yeah, we have really low societal expectations today, and we've created a culture that is not biblical in so many ways, in the way that not only we raise our kids, but the expectations we have from them. Yeah. Uh, you and I have a very good friend, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Yes. And Rabbi Lappin is my rabbi. Every Christian needs a rabbi, and he's my rabbi. And one of the interesting conversations we had at one point, we were talking, he said, you know, the first time God revealed himself to man, he did so in the Hebrew language. That was the language he chose to reveal himself to the Hebrew people. He spoke Hebrew to them. That's the first language that, that God chose to reveal himself to. And he said, and it's interesting that in Hebrew, every word means something. There is nothing wasted in Hebrew. He said, for example, he said, did you know that in Hebrew you cannot say the word coincidence? Hmm. Said, no, I didn't know that. He said, never crossed God's mind that anything was a coincidence. <laughs> but wow. he, So he never spoke the word. It doesn't exist in Hebrew. And so what is not even there in Hebrew tells us a lot about what the Bible teaches. The fact that there is no coincidence that God ordains and orchestrates, that's pretty significant. Uh, another thing that you will not find in Hebrew is the word fair. Fair, uh, God's not concerned with what's fair, it's how are you going to respond. What happened to Job yeah. wasn't fair, but Job responded well. What happened to Jesus wasn't fair, what happened to Joseph wasn't fair. It's not about being fair, it's how you respond. So, so the it's word okay when fair, the kids say that's not fair to say, well that's not in Hebrew so don't even use it. That, that's that, right, that, that, it has nothing to do. And so there are so many phrases like that that, that don't exist at all. Uh, this is a really good one. Another one that does not exist in Hebrew is the word adolescence. Now, we have a whole culture built around oh, adolescence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And adolescence is really defined as that time of immaturity before you become an adult. And yeah, we, these days it's not a couple of years anymore. It's well, no, it, 10, the, 12. <laughs> it starts at 13 and goes to 35. Right, you know, right, that's exactly. A, yes. It's, it's a couple of decades that's now. That's right. It's a couple of decades. And so adolescence is a term that never existed in the Bible because there was never a time when you were not to be a man hmm. or a woman. You, you weren't supposed to be stuck in childhood. You went childhood. from being a child to man, being a man. You want to get out of that as, as fast as you can. Yeah. And, and that's why David was just a teen, maybe a preteen, when he slew the lion and the bear and Goliath. Hmm. Uh, you know, historians are not sure, but it's really there in the early teens. Maybe he was 12, maybe he was 14, maybe 15. I don't care. Any of that is a whole lot earlier than what we'd expect it today. King Josiah was eight years old when he started to reign. Samuel, they, they say he may have been somewhere between four and 12 when the Lord spoke to him and called him to his ministry there mm -hmm. with Eli. Uh, you've got so many, Jesus was 12 years old when he was in the temple confounding the doctors of the law. Already about his father's already business, about already it. knew his purpose. 12 he, years yeah. old. 
And that was not that uncommon. We say, oh, that's because he's Jesus, the Son of God. No, in the Hebrew culture, when you were 13 years old, you were a man. You went from being a boy to being a man. When you turn 13, no longer are your parents responsible for you because you're a man. You answer for your own decisions. You make your own decisions. It is your life. That had to make you act differently. I mean, if that's what your parents' mm -hmm. expectation or the culture's expectation was, then surely you responded in a, in a much more uh, purposeful way than we do today in those decades. And we don't of, have that expectation yeah. today. And, and let me read you a passage out of the Bible where that they're talking to young men. And this is the passage out of 1 John chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. And it says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the Word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. How many youth groups tell that to their 12 wow. year olds? Yeah. And, and he, he continues, he says, if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. We're talking to 12 year olds with that passage. And, and now we're having trouble getting into college age kids to study that passage. So when he says, I write to you young men because you're strong and the Word of God lives in you and you've overcome the evil one, why aren't we teaching that in youth groups? And why aren't we teaching that to our preteens? Because that's where it was written. And, and by the way, if you want to talk about being biblical, find me youth ministry in the Bible. Mm -hmm. it, we, it wasn't about keeping you young and enjoying your childhood, enjoy your immaturity. No, we want you out of your immaturity. You need to move on to maturity. And yeah. see, we are so mediocre in America. Today, and this happened back in the 1920s where we changed our whole form of education, our expectations of kids, that we think it's always been this way. And what we've got right now in America with this culture of adolescence is a brand new thing in our history. Yeah, didn't used to be that way. Let's get another question from the audience. David, my daughter, who's a freshman in high school, came home the other day with a test that she had taken at school. She did poorly on the test, but the teacher said, take this home, make corrections, bring it back, and I'll give you half credit on it. It just doesn't seem like education is as rigorous today as it used to be. Is it just my imagination, or have we dumbed down education? Well, you said right before the question, there's nowhere in the Bible that you have youth ministers. We kind of dumb it down mm -hmm. for that age group. Same thing in our overall education system. Do Are we as rigorous today as we were in the founding era? No, not by a long shot. And it's really easy to prove just by not going back to the founding era, but going to every other generation, looking at the testing, looking in the school books. For example, one of the problems we have today is until 1920s, we taught students how to think. In the 1920s, the progressive educators got a hold of education. They were really secular, John Dewey and so many others. And they said, no, 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 you don't need to know how to think. We'll think for you, you just learn. And so what they did was they took the emphasis off of kids learning how to think and saying, we'll think for you, you just memorize what we tell you. So in the 1920s, we came up with fill in the blank test with true, false, with multiple choice. I'm the teacher and the source of all knowledge for you. I'll say it and you just spit it back on the test. Prior to that, it wasn't that way. For example, this is a book that we used in American schools for about 300 years. It's called Watts on the Improvement of the Mind, Isaac Watts. And we taught you how to think. It was all about you learning. And how did we do that? Well, there's a lot of exercises. This is a book from back in the founding era. And this book has what are called forensics. And I have to admit, when I saw forensics, I said, I've watched enough TV. That's when they do an autopsy, right? <laughs> right, no, right. No, no, no. Yeah, forensics was when your teacher would walk into class and say, all right, here's the topic. And they say, okay, you're for it, you're against it. You guys go at each other. But wait a minute, I'm on the, I don't care what side you're on. You figure out the weaknesses in his logic. Yeah. You create strengths in your own argument. You see what you can argue and see how you can take apart his argument. Think through this. No matter what side you believe, learn how to think. And then after you got done, you reversed it. You went the other way. And so you go, wow. And, and so I started looking at, at the forensics as they used. Let me read you some of the forensics. And this is Robert Troop Payne. This goes back into the, in, into the founding era kind of time. Uh, here's one. The conduct of the patriots who destroyed the tea in Boston Harbor. So we're talking 1773. Is that conduct to be condemned or is it to be praised? Hmm. You're, so you take both sides. You take, you, you take the condemned side, you yeah. take the praise. All right, let's see you guys go after it. And go, wow. Here, here's another one, it's still talking forensics. It says, is there more to be gained or lost by a new translation of the scriptures for common use? If we have new translated scriptures in modern language, is that good or is that bad? Mm. And you, you guys argue it out, go after it. Uh, here's another forensic. Is it more dangerous to believe too little or to believe too much? 
how you're going to come up. See, the point wasn't what's right or wrong with this. The point is learn how to think. Learn how to recognize weaknesses. See, today, because we have learned how to learn, we believe anything the media tells us. Yeah. If a PhD in class tells us, our, my professor told me we so. We just receive it in instead of questioning and, and thinking through it. Who cares what he told you? Is it true or not? What was the age target for a book like this? Oh, I'm really disappointed you asked me that. Um, because now that you've asked me that, I've got to answer it. And, and it's going to embarrass me and our education system today, right? <laughs> and I, I need to tell everybody, this wasn't set up. I didn't tell you to ask right. me this. You just, you just asked me. All right. Uh, first off, let me talk to you about a founding father named Fisher Ames. Fisher Ames is the founding father. He's a framer of the Bill of Rights. He gave us the House language for the First Amendment of the Constitution. He entered Harvard when he was 12 years old. Wow, Twelve. that's young. Now, let's, let's, let's not be impressed yet. The average age at which you entered university at that point in time was 13. So he's only so he wasn't a little that smart. far ahead of his peers. But Way ahead of us, but that, not that far ahead. Let, let's talk about going to university back then. Going to university back then, you had an entry exam. Today, our kids take the ACT or SAT generally. That's the entry exam. Back then, you took an entry exam, and it was real simple. Prove that you're trilingual. Prove that you're fluent in Latin and Greek and English. What? At well, 13. At 13. And, or in and his case, 12. In his case, 12, because he's a little sharper than his, his neighbors. English, I understand, you know, like that book. Why Greek? By the way, read something out there if you would. <laughs> I have a feeling I'm getting set up here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The line is, it's all Greek to me. Yeah, that, that is definitely the line, because that is Greek to me. That's a Greek New Testament. When you're 13 years old at college, they give you that. You make a handwritten translation of Greek New Testament in English. So at that's 13 years that, old. That's average American, 13 year old that goes to college. Wow. So that that's the Greek side. Now, Latin, that's where the classics were. It's, how could you study Homer or Cicero or Plutarch if you didn't know Latin? This right here is the um, graduation exam. And, and you'll see here a name that you recognize. You see John Quincy Adams right there? Mm -hmm. So John yeah. Quincy Adams, uh, he's a young man. He was about 18. He was actually 13, uh, I think he was 13 or 14 when he started the university at Leiden University. He was over in Europe serving at the time. And so he starts university there. He finishes at Harvard. Um, read to me the address that he gave on his graduation. I don't think I'm getting set up again. You're getting set yeah, up again. Yeah, and I see. asked you to read it because I have no clue what it is. <laughs> yeah. It is in Latin. Wow. It, and you didn't just have a, a valedictorian and salutatorian give a Latin address. Every single student in the class gave their address no in Latin. You've got to master those three languages. And we're talking 13 years old. What were we doing before that? Glad you asked that. Let's go back to some of these books. Um, this is the first spelling book ever done in American history. Noah Webster did this. It became known as Webster's Blueback Speller. So this is what's going to get us to the point where somebody at 13 could do these kind of things. This, 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 this is, is the foundation. 1782, we start with it. It's 150 years, our elementary spelling book. I'm, I'm going to read some of the elementary spelling. No, I'm, I'm not, because I can't. I, I looked at this, and I cannot pronounce many of these words. Um, nugacity, uh, purpose, purpose scarcity. Pert pertinacity, uh, rapacit. These are elementary. These are elementary. Yeah. And he says in the front here, he says, now, th these words are hard. He said, but if you ever go down to where the students are, they'll stop rising. If you go down there, you'll have to go down again and again because they'll continue to fall forward. He says, hold high expectations. And so for 150 years, this is what we did. Now, l let's not stop there. Let's go for a minute to Matt. And, and let me just make this real clear. 13 years old, average, you're going to university. Until the 1920s, nobody went past the eighth grade in America. That was as far as you went was eighth grade. So this progressive education stuff said, oh no, you need 12 years of school, it, it, you, you need compulsive education, you need to keep God out of it. And don't think, you just learn what we mm. tell you. I mean, we've changed everything. So let me go back to some math examples here. Now, th this is this is your exit exam for eighth grade. You can't graduate school unless you can pass the, these math questions. I used to be a math teacher. I'm not even going to try some of these questions here, but I, I do want to read some of these, these math questions. I insured two-thirds of a shop worth $3,600 and four-fifths of a house worth $6,000, paying $126. What was the rate of insurance? Eighth grade. 
Now, you, I don't have to answer that, do I? Yeah. You've already done postdoctoral. You got your right. JD, so go ahead and answer yeah, that. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that. I think we should let the audience work on that one. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't want to give away exactly. the answer. That's or anything. right. Yeah. <clears throat> Here's another one. How many $50 shares at 8% discount must be given for 23 bonds, $100 each at 2% premium? This is an eighth grader doing eighth this. Eighth grader, and you can't graduate from school unless you can answer that. Now, you also had, before you got to there, you had to pass what was called intellectual arithmetic. In other words, this, these are problems you have to solve without paper and pencil. You gotta do it in your mind. So we're, we're again, before eighth grade, and let me give you some intellectual arithmetic problems here. A boat worth $864, of which one eighth belonged to A, one fourth to B, and the rest to C was lost. What loss did each sustain at having been insured for $500? Solve that in your mind. Wow. No paper. Here's one more. If six men can do a piece of work in five days, in what time can they do it if they receive the assistance of three additional men when the work is half completed? So, I, I, I mean, these, obviously, we used to do a better job. Why did it, when did it change? And why would we change it? Wouldn't we want to continue to be exceptional and continue to raise generations that could do these kind of things? Well, uh, we, again, got away from being student-centered to adult-centered. We are in charge of everything you need to know. We, we don't want you to learn to fish for yourself. We want to give you fish every day. We want day. it cheap, so I guess. I mean, we, right. you, you wanted people that would just accept whatever you taught instead of getting them to think for themselves. And so we no longer have the high expectations. As a matter of fact, we're convinced today that most kids can't do this stuff. And so, oh, we don't want to memorize this. That is so boring. We don't want to do phonics anymore. I mean, who wants to learn? Let's do whole language reading. That was a complete failure. Oh, we're tired of old math. We want new math. Right. And so we don't care how well it works. We're always trying to create something new. And we've gotten away from measuring and testing what really works. And now we put ourselves in the realm of being smart. We put ourselves in the realm of God, quite frankly. Yeah. We're going to determine what works and what doesn't. No. We have proven history on this, and all of this that we did. For this. So, yeah, give, give me some real, uh, some real people from that era and some of the things that they right. did. Some examples. And, and let me let me tell you the expectation. And this, here's how they raised their kids. Go to John Adams and Abigail. John was away from home a number of years in the American Revolution. Abigail's got to raise all the kids, and so as John's away from home and he's at Congress, and he's over in France and over in England, elsewhere. This is what he told Abigail. He said, Abigail, he said it should be your care therefore and mine, to elevate the minds of our children with an ambition to excel in every capacity, faculty, and virtue. If we suffer their minds to grovel and creep in infancy, they will grovel all their lives. Mm. So Abigail, you and I, we've got to elevate the way they think. See, that was the Jewish thing of when you're 13, you're a man, Bubba, and we're training you for manhood. Yeah. So let's take John Quincy Adams, the, the, the son of, of Abigail and John. Eight years old, he's marching with the Massachusetts Minutemen. Uh, the British, all the Minutemen, eight years old, already has the musket drills down, he's marching with the Minutemen. Eleven years old, he is the secretary going with his father over to France as official secretary to his father, who's the ambassador. At 13 years old, he traveled to Holland, began attending Leiden University in Holland. At 14 years old, he is the official secretary and the French interpreter for the U.S. ambassador in Russia. So he's gone to St. Petersburg, Russia by himself at 14, the translator and, and the interpreter for, for the ambassador. At 15, he returned from St. Petersburg back to The Hague. It was an overland journey of six months. He did it by himself at age 15, all the language bearers, all the money bearers. And when he was 16 years old, he was the official secretary to the peace commissioners negotiating the end of the American Revolution. So there's a kid by 16, he's had more political experience than most of our ambassadors have when they're 85 years old. Yeah. Let's jump to somebody else. Well, you can take John Trumbull. Now, John Trumbull was a justice on the Supreme Court of Connecticut, and, and John Trumbull, when he was four years old, had finished reading the King James Bible through from cover to cover for the first time. When he was six years old, he beat his minister in a Greek contest. At six. At six. When he was seven and a half years old, he passed the entrance exam to Yale University, but his parents said, well, that's a little young. We'll hold you out till you're 13 because that's when everybody else goes. Uh, you've got John Witherspoon. When he was four years old, he too had finished reading through the entire King James Bible cover to cover. And when he was still a kid, he'd memorized nearly all of the New Testament, just as still a child. You take uh, George Wythe, signer of the Declaration. When he was three years old, he'd already begun a study of the classics, Latin and Greek and all the classics. Uh, you take Benjamin Rush. Hang on, wait. At three years old. At three years old. Okay. I just, I, it has to sink in for a minute for me. So we're talking four years old on some of these things, three years old, six, seven. And these are when our kids are 
I, not even in school not yet. Even not in even school. In working on learning anything. Now, I told you the average age when kids went to university is 13. Well, you had signer of the Declaration, Benjamin Rush. He was a little smarter than his peers. When he was 14 years old, he graduated from Princeton. Already graduated already at the age finished. of 14. Mm -hmm. uh, you have William Livingston, signer of the Constitution. When he was 14 years old, he was already living as a missionary among the Mohawk Indians, the most ferocious tribe known at that point in time. Andrew Jackson, 13 years old, is already a soldier in the American Revolution. At 14 years old, he's already a prisoner of war, imprisoned by the British for fighting in the Revolution. Uh, you have Phyllis Wheatley. Phyllis Wheatley, the first black poetess, eight years old, starts her poetry, writing her poetry. She came to America at the age of six, not knowing English, and so she has to learn English and Latin and Greek and all, but she, she was bought as a slave from Senegal, and she's the first black poetess and, and does this type of stuff. Um, there's a lot of others. Uh, let me just focus on a few more that I have fun with for a bit. I, I want to I introduce you to this guy right here. This guy right here, he looks like a crusty old codger, doesn't he? That's Bronco Charlie. He's, he's a Pony Express rider. Now, Pony Express. So, so cool. Bronco Charlie, right? So here we got a Pony Express rider, Bronco Charlie. Pretty impressive. Um, it's not impressive yet. How do you think he is there? In and this one or yeah. this one? T take oh, this one. Here where, oh, here where he's the riding? Yeah. Oh, he's got to be, I don't know, 65. All right, 65. How old do you think here? What would you guess? 25, 30. All right. Let me show you the recruiting poster for Pony Express. This is what they use to recruit. It says, uh, from St. Joe, Missouri to California in 10 days or less. Now, St. Joe, Missouri to California, 1,800 miles. 10 days, that's 180 miles a day. I ride horses all the time. If I can put 40 miles on a horse in a day, I've worn the horse out, I've worn me out. They're going 180, 180 miles. 180 miles in one day. For 10, day 10 after straight day days. After day. Okay, now let's keep going. Wanted, young, skinny, wiry fellows, not <laughs> over 18, must be expert riders willing to risk death daily. Orphans preferred, <laughs> 25 bucks a week for wages. Wow. So okay. we saw him when he was 70, we saw him when he was 25. No, no, no. He, 11 years old, he was a Pony Express rider. He did this at 11 years old. At 11 old. years old, he was a Pony Express rider. And at eight years old, he was already a professional Bronc Buster. At 11 years old, he's riding 180 miles a day on a horse galloping. He's fighting, he's fighting outlaws, he's fighting storms, he's fighting raging rivers. And, and by the way, um, the guys who started Pony Express, Waddell, Smith, and Russell, they gave each of their riders a Bible, Pony Express Bible, because they all needed spiritual grounding. They're, they're young boys, many of them are orphans. They need, so this is our expectation for, for young boys. Uh, we have a, a Civil War hero. Uh, his name is John Clem. At the Battle of Chickamauga, he, on the battlefield, for bravery on the battlefield, for what he did, General Rosecrans saw what he did and promoted him to sergeant on the ba battlefield commission, made him a sergeant. General Thomas came by and said, no, 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 I need you on my staff. I'm making you a lieutenant. That guy right there behind me. This kid. 12 years old. There he is as a sergeant, 12 years old. He's 12 years old, he's a lieutenant on a general staff at 12 years old. Our expectations are so, so, so low now. Let me take one more. Let's take this one right here. These guys behind you. Now, these guys behind you, these are the first black Americans to serve in Congress. On the left, you've got Hiram Rhodes Revels. He's, he's from Mississippi. Beside him, you've got Benjamin Turner. Benjamin Turner is from Alabama. The, the next guy up is Robert DeLarge. He's from South Carolina. The guy sitting right in the middle is Josiah Walls of Florida. Uh, the next guy on the right is Jefferson Long. He's from Georgia. And then two guys on the far right, Joseph Hayne Rainey and Robert Brown Elliott, both from South Carolina. And by the way, the, the, the guy second in from the right, Joseph Hayne Rainey, is the first black American to preside over the House of Representatives. Mm. Nobody ever hears that. These, these are the first seven blacks elected to Congress as a result of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment of the Constitution. Now, here's the deal. They're all out of southern states. They're all out of the Confederacy. And in the Confederacy, it was a capital offense to teach a black person to read. If you taught a black to read, you're going to get them killed, and you're going to get yourself killed. Wow. Because just, just teaching see, them to read. If you teach them to read, they're likely to read the Bible. And if they read the Bible, they're probably going to end up praying. If they pray, you know what they're going to pray for is end of slavery. You don't want that going on. So it's a capital offense to teach a black to read. Mm. So these guys, the first 23 blacks elected to Congress, 13 of them had been slaves. So we're talking that half these guys had been in slavery five years before they're serving in Congress. Now, if you want to get thoroughly embarrassed, you read their speeches in Congress. 
I have. There's a website called Neglected Voices. And you can read their speeches there. When you do it, you better have a dictionary in one hand and a thesaurus in the other. They're all self-taught. They taught themselves in five years. And what they taught themselves in five years from being an adult slave to being an adult congressman. So, so David, that means no matter where you are right now in your life, no matter what your age is, it doesn't matter. no matter what the past has, has been in matter. your life, you can do the same you, thing. You can do exactly the same thing. You have to raise expectations. You have to set a higher goal for yourself, but you need to set it for everybody around you. Yeah. And in this country, in this culture today, we don't expect much of anybody. We expect, me, we expect our congressmen to all be a bunch of crooks mm. and to fail. We expect our church to be irrelevant. They got no backbone. Pastor wants it. We have such low expectations and ever. Great. Raise them for yourself if nobody else. You do what these guys did. Yeah. In five years, what they taught themselves, they became, as a matter of fact, that guy on the, on the right there, Robert Brown Elliott, he took on the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, in a debate on the House floor and so wiped the floor oh, wow. with the vice president of the Confederacy. He'd given a speech that said, slavery is the cornerstone of the Confederacy. This guy is property. He's he so wiped the floor with the vice president of the Confederacy that all the vice presidents say is, well, somebody must have written that speech for you. There's no way you're that smart. Oh, wow. Five years, he takes down the vice president of the Confederacy in a debate. So it's not enough. We can't just blame the education system, blame the politicians. No. We have to say, look, it starts with us. It does. If you can do that in five years, no matter where we are, we can begin to raise our own expectations right. for ourselves, for our kids, for the people in our community, and we can turn it around. But the first thing is raise the expectations, set a higher bar. First thing, and, and, and that's the action items, set a high goal for yourself and for those around you. You, you expect more out of yourself, yeah. you, you, you push yourself, but then once you do that, encourage youth around you. I mean, you got neighbors, you, you got kids that are your grandkids, you, you got your own kids you're raising, you, you go to a church with some kids. Raise their expectations. You can do this. Yeah. You, you can do this. They don't hear that in the culture, that's and they right. need to. And that's one of the foundations of America's freedom, is that kind of expectation that we had for Americans and for youth, and Americans met that expectation.